So slightly unusually, it gives me an opportunity to uh, further introduce myself. And I guess one of the things I've picked up uh, particularly from uh, Chris's talk there was how academics tend to deliver in information deficit. And that was actually the structure of this talk. Um, so to avoid that and learn straight away, um, I'd like to build on one of uh, Chris's points about hope uh, and planetary intelligence. Every time I say that, I remember uh, Team America World Police when they think about the, uh, the computer called intelligence and all the information it provides. Um, but if you could just raise your hands, please. If combined, you both come away from uh, this session or the sessions combined so far with hope and a sense that you do understand and believe in climate change. I think that's fairly conclusive, and I hope that means we've at least got tent-based intelligence. It's only a small step then, I would hope, to uh, future planetary intelligence. So that's a, it's a very good sign at least. So Ian gave me uh, the remit here to uh, discuss or talk about energy and climate change uh, and that which the university has provided in terms of its research uh, in the last uh, 18 months or so in the space of 10 minutes. So I'm going to offer <laughs> what is really quite a... If I hope no one's epileptic, I've got 30 slides to get through in 10 minutes. Um, there's a vast amount of work, of course, that's taking place at the university, and this is purely a fraction of it. But I'm going to build it around these two elements. What have we learnt about energy and climate in 2017, and have humans left their mark? So. Of course, one of the things that we read in the papers and in the press widely is this idea that new power is now coming from renewables. In fact, uh, not only in the, last, uh, in the last five years or so, we've moved from all new additions in power, sorry, uh, more new additions coming from renewable energies than those coming from fossil fuels. That must be a good thing. Uh, here, data from um, Bloomsburg demonstrate potentially the beginning of the end. Uh, that all these new additions will add up over the next few years and are predicted by 2030 uh, to have um, a vast proportion pretty much based on solar and wind driving our new uh, additional contributions. Could we be on the verge of Carmageddon? And I take no credit for that phrase either. Uh, it's provided by somebody else. But you'll see on the left-hand side there the rise of electric cars, which now dominate, not dominate, which now take up 1% or so of uh, the total cars uh, market in the globally, and then predictions of how that should, or rather needs to, rise to try and meet um, some of the pledges made uh, as part of the Paris Agreement. So you look at those sorts of figures and you think, fine, the low carbon transition is happening on its own, just fine, right? Well, no. Various questions remain. There is still a role for research, you'd be pleased to know, those of you employed in the academic sector. How will the world achieve those Paris targets? We heard a lot of hope coming away from uh, 2015, but questions of, actually of, its, of their implementation uh, remain. How will, what will low carbon mean for individuals and their ways of life and behaviours? Chris highlighted beautifully the importance of building into instinctive values and instinctive attitudes, and how those will uh, be, be important in terms of changing behaviours. And also, how will the future Earth respond uh, alongside the new society? We're learning much more as climate scientists about actually the way the Earth responds and its sensitivity under different climatic conditions. And things will change in the future with higher carbon dioxide concentrations. So I imagine many of you will have seen this, and those of you who hadn't might find it rather disturbing. These are the pledges. These are what are called INDCs, uh, provided by four major contributors to greenhouse gas emissions uh, and the rest of the world. And what you can see here, uh, the large... Um, the black line, sorry, curling down, is a 66% chance of, a two, of achieving a two-degree uh, future um, planet, planetary temperature, one that's two degrees higher than current. And you'll see that by 2028, at least, no one else in the world is allowed to produce any emissions whatsoever apart from these four if they stick to their pledges. And, of course, we all recognise that this one may already be under threat. So addressing those kind of issues uh, and unpicking the policy behind the pledges, we have uh, Professor Ian Bailey in the Geography Department, and Ian's been looking at uh, this from a variety of different angles, but not least through a case study in New Zealand, where New Zealand was criticised um, for its rather poor pledge that it put forward as, uh, as an INDC in response to the Paris Agreement. Um, Ian's work has demonstrated really that it's not the INDCs that matter so much, it's rather the substantiation, but the quality of the political driver um, behind uh, the INDC as it gets launched. So 
And Ian argues uh, in these recent papers, the need for forms of policy intervention that encourage step change in energy, industry, and personal behavior. Now, I've highlighted that in red because, it, again, it builds on um, Chris's points, but also highlights work that's been taking place in the School of Psychology, Sabina Powell highlighted here. And this was a, a paper first authored by Sabina out last year that is really the, was, was the summary paper of a project that was EPSRC funded, um, looking at energy visualization. Now, we heard the importance of how we make up our minds, how we understand things, not only based on our intrinsic values, but also what we can feel, what we can experience, as Chris highlighted. So, the visual element of that, uh, and the, sci the sociological and the, um, psychological literature is, 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 uh, is buoyant in, in the area of understanding energy visualization, but its application, particularly to behavior change, is something that um, is an opportunity in the future, and there's a wonderful paper there. I should say that EVIS, the project, uh, lives on. Uh, that's been captured now in a report to uh, the city of Vancouver, but also in gaming technology. So a brand new game has come out, the Energy Cat, the House of Tomorrow, and please do uh, contact Sabina if you'd like to know how to play that. Um, there might be an opportunity today, I hope. And then, uh, as recently as yesterday, astonishing as it may be, there was another conference organized for the same time as this one. Uh, and it was the Global Conference on Energy Efficiency. Uh, and it was agreed in a quick poll, the delegates of the IEA, IEA have voted energy efficient and an en an energy efficient world Sorry, will depend on all three factors in this order. People, policies and technology. It's not just about technology, it's about be bringing the people and uh, the political structure with it. Natural gas is an interesting area. We tend to think of it as the secure, lower uh, carbon bridging fuel. We can't simply go from a fossil fuel world to one that is entirely renewable. And you can see these data taken from the EIA uh, demonstrating that America is switching very quickly to the production of its electricity by natural gas. You see the rise of gas there at a global level. Uh, actually, it's got one of the fastest increasing rates in terms of its contribution uh, to greenhouse gas emissions. And that poses some interesting questions. For example, from where should we get our gas in the future? Now, this, this particular place, Doha, has been in the news for various reasons uh, in the last month or so. Uh, and this particular place has been in the news for a great other many reasons. But um, particularly the figure on the right there shows you that there is the potential, at least, and I almost feel like a heathen putting this up in a, in a sustainability conference, but the idea that the UK could provide its own gas if we're willing to think differently. I, I need and a key way in which we can try and achieve understanding, bringing people, policy, and technology with us, is, of course, into understanding those pro the process of energy transitions. And again, Ian Bailey's work here looking into integrating justice into energy transitions, helping uh, individuals, communities, and others understand the process, see the legitimacy of it, uh, and then, therefore, buy into it. Um, and a key thing that uh, Ian's been looking at not only is fracking, but then also uh, the distribution of uh, wind energy and how we deploy uh, wind in, in Cornwall in particular. And one of the key things Ian wanted me to mention was that simply pushing ahead with fracking or even sacrificing large areas to renewables, generally not just in wind, but also in the marine environment, without considering adverse impacts or consultation on due process uh, in decision-making is deeply problematic. So actually understanding the process by which we move to a low-carbon transition is critical. We also find ourselves at a political juncture. This will not have passed your attention, I'm sure. Uh, President Trump intends to withdraw from the Paris Agreement. Um, interestingly, when you read behind the lines of that, that means, in, that means changes to the Clean Power Act, but also changes to regulations on methane leaks. Methane? We always think of carbon dioxide as the principal uh, greenhouse gas, but methane is highly important as well. Methane started to tail off briefly, uh, for a period in the beginning of this decade. But it's subsequently increased, and it's a cause for scientific investigation, but also a cause for concern. We are unsure why this is increasing. There are a variety of different reasons why it could be. And it is accelerating. Shale gas is a major source of methane. You can see this, this data here, taken from Howarth and others, uh, demonstrate that actually the, the leakage from shale gas provides a huge amount of methane, and of course methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas uh, than carbon dioxide. This was picked up in the BBC, uh, Jonathan Amos uh, reporting from the AGU in 2016, the methane surge needs urgent attention. 
Now, the Global Carbon Project has done a fantastic job of bringing together our understanding of carbon dioxide and methane in the natural environment, in the, in the planetary environment, and we recognize that it could be from any of these sources. Uh, so methane from uh, shale gas, for example, would be probably from this one over here. Um, but there's a, the Earth itself is responsible for a large amount of exchange between the surface and the atmosphere in terms of methane. And one of the key uh, contributors to that, from the natural sources at least, are wetlands. A wonderful picture here, which I took in a helicopter over Canada. And you can see that very same area of Canada in Quebec is one of the key sources highlighted red there. So some of the work that we've been doing here, part of my project with uh, a NERC um, Best Funded project, has been to look at the role of uh, surface processes in those peatlands and asking the question uh, whether or not microbial, uh, or rather microbes, can provide an engineering tool, a geoengineering tool, to mitigate what may well be a methane bomb. So uh, we are discovering quite readily that a lot of these sites are not producing quite so much methane as was, as was originally suspected, uh, and it looks like um, there may be some microbial activity uh, involved in uh, mitigating that naturally. And what of the oceans? The oceans are improving, or have improved, since the 1960s as an oceanic sink of carbon dioxide, based on partial pressure differences. Uh, you can see here the amount to which the ocean provides a sink, as well as the atmosphere, um, for our collective uh, greenhouse gas contributions. Of course, a fully understanding the role of the ocean and understanding how uh, the Earth is sensitive to its oceanic surface area um, means going back in time as well. So uh, we saw yesterday the, the Holocene, a wonderful picture of the Holocene uh, from the ice core records. Um, we also want to know where sea ice has been uh, and uh, will be in the future. So understanding the oceanic sink is understanding how much free ocean space there is for carbon dioxide and other gases to enter the ocean, means understanding where the ice is. And Simon Belt and others in organic geochemistry have developed a marker, a biomarker, that allows us to uh, go back in time using oceanic cores and see exactly where that sea ice was. That was published in Nature Communications last year. And, very, and finally, we're asking questions about whether or not we've made our mark. We've heard about this term, the Anthropocene. And this, I've taken these figures actually from uh, an article in The Guardian, in which Chris, in fact, was quoted. Um, we're looking for markers, geological markers, of human influence in changing the climate and changing our environment. Uh, there are those that have suggested that it could be the bomb testing of the 50s and 60s. There are those that have also suggested it could be soot, particularly uh, across the Northern Hemisphere. There are even those that have suggested it could be the proliferation of chickens. Now, you jest. The domesticated chicken has uh, exponentially increased, thinking back to Owen's uh, discussion of exponentials yesterday. Uh, this may well be a biomarker. Or it could simply be a step change in biodiversity. So these are data taken from Chile and Argentina, and we've been investigating peatlands down there, and effectively what we've been able to reconstruct is a, step, a, a monumental step change shift in microbial biodiversity in the surface of those peatlands from more or less the middle of the 20th century. Uh, to some extent, this is driven by climate change. It may also be driven by these particular creatures being somewhat more resistant to sunburn in an area in which we have uh, the ozone hole. So fully understanding and fully appreciating what this kind of biomarker is is something we're trying to do now. But um, we can come up with these final conclusions, you imagine, from that. What have we learned about energy and climate in 2017 and how have Plymouth contributed to that? Well, we've got policy interventions that need a step change. We have visualizing en energy as a promising new area of research. We can track past Antarctic sea ice extent, and there may well be biological solutions to climate uh, that are possible as part of this geoengineering option. Have humans left their mark? Almost certainly. And I'll leave you with that.